question of what regimen to use for a newly diagnosed symptomatic myeloma is a really important one. Uh, we don't see in any single study that the median overall survival or the overall survival of Kaplan-Meier curves is flat. We continually lose patients, and so we haven't yet cured patients. And I think most vulnerable are probably high-risk patients, frail elderly, renal failure who don't improve. And so in these patients, there's this thought sometimes people have, I want to save my drugs for later. When we think about when to use our most potent drugs, um, there's this concern that if we use our early, good drugs early, what will we use in relapse? And I think the response to that are the concepts of attrition and diminishing returns. So if you start with 1,000 newly diagnosed patients, we know that no study has shown that the survival curves are flat. People will unfortunately die continually, and those are in particular the frail elderly, the renal failure patients who don't recover their kidneys, and high-risk patients. And so these groups in particular may not be able to get to that first relapse to have access to these novel drugs. So I think that's an important concept, which is this attrition. And then the second is that whenever we look at response rates in PFS, there's a diminishing returns. Our, our deepest remissions and most durable remissions are in the first treatment, followed by the rel first relapse, second relapse, and progressively downward. And so if we want to get the maximal bang for our buck, I think it's important to use these drugs early. However, it doesn't mean that every patient needs to get every drug forever. I think the point is we start with aggressive therapies, and then we can try to maintain these patients on the minimal number of drugs that that patient needs based on their patient and disease profile. In terms of the transplant eligible population, the discussion of RVD versus KRD is an important one. Um, certainly, KRD, based on the Forte study, shows dramatic results with excellent MRD negativity. Um, and in, initially, with the study comparing, there were two parts of Forte. One was the KCD versus KRD, which we discussed that the KRD was superior. But the other question being asked in Forte was KRD for a year versus KRD with transplant consolidation. And there, uh, the initial responses look comparable, showing the potency of this drug. The only consideration is I think we have no head-to-head -head studies yet for KRD versus VRD or K versus V, other than the fact that we have Endeavor, which is bortezomib 1.3 milligrams per meter squared twice weekly, compared to carfilzomib at 56 milligrams per meter squared twice weekly. But the problem is that you can't use 56 milligrams per meter squared with a concurrent image because of cardiopulmonary concerns. And so the question becomes, if you're going to do VRD and KRD, where now you do have an IMID, what is the relative head-to-head -head comparator? And we don't have that answer. And the other challenge with head-to-head -head comparisons is even if we say induction and consolidation, the KRD is typically given over a 28-day cycle versus VRDs are typically 21-day cycles. So even when we say six cycles, the amount of chemo that a patient's getting is different. So when we think about all of that complexity, uh, there is no real one right answer, I think, um, and there's also patient and physician preferences. Both are really good options uh, and can be used on label. There's many different dosing regimens for carfilzomib. And initially, it was approved at 20 and 27 milligrams per meter squared. So 20 was day 1 and 2, followed by 27, uh, day 8, 9, 15, 16, and thereafter. And this showed a response rate in PFS in the heavily treated patient population of approximately 25% three to four months. And then the ARROW study was done to essentially look for convenience. And the question is, if you give carfilzomib at 70 milligrams per meter squared once weekly versus the 2027, is there a difference? And so what I find interesting about this study is what was initially designed as a convenience study, looking at weekly versus twice weekly, ended up not only showing that it's obviously a convenient regimen, but also showed better response rate in PFS. Now, of course, some of that comes from the fact that the cumulative dose administered is going to be higher. 70 milligrams per meter squared over three weeks is actually 210. So that's a, that when we compare those to different regimens, it's important to not only look at the weekly dosing, but also the cumulative monthly dosing. But clearly, Arrow shows that as a single agent, 70 milligrams per meter squared weekly is the preferred dose and schedule. Now, there are other doses and schedules that are also approved. Uh, the next kind of carfilzomib single agent approval is the Endeavor study, which is uh, carfilzomib at 56 milligrams per meter squared when compared to, and that's when a twice weekly schedule, 1, 2, 8, 9, 15, 16. And when that was compared head to head with bortezomib, showed again superior response rates in PFS and also recently translated into OS benefit. So if somebody's just using carfilzomib, that's also a very powerful regimen, and that would probably be the most potent regimen without a third drug. 
The complexity comes in, what do you do when you're add in, adding in a third drug? And I think it depends on what the third drug is. So for example, if you're using a monoclonal antibody such as daratumumab, uh, we've published in blood that you can give it safely at 70 milligrams per meter squared with standard dosing. And that is now listed in the NCCN as an option for relapse disease. When it comes to cyclophosphamide, recent data presented from the UK by Dr. Yang, uh, known as the Cardamon study, also looked at the use of carfilzomib at 56 milligrams per meter squared twice weekly with cyclophosphamide. So that is another option as well. I think the main concern comes when you use an imid. So if you're combining carfilzomib with either lenalidomide or pomalidomide, and likely thalidomide as well, there is going to be a higher rate of cardiac and pulmonary issues and thrombotic events. So for those patients, it is probably better not to go more than 56 milligrams per meter squared weekly. And that is what several studies were done that have been discussed at this year's ASH 2019 did. And that includes Dr. Costa's master study, as well as Dr. Langren's study. And both of these use carfilzomib at 56 milligrams per meter squared once a week, day 1, 8, and 15, in combination with lenalidomide. They also used, of course, daratumumab. But I think the principle is that carfilzomib with an imid should probably not be given more than 56 milligrams per meter squared once weekly. One other option that patients can receive uh, with concurrent imid with car would be carfilzomib 36 mil milligrams per meter squared twice weekly, so 1, 2, 8, 9, 15, 16. That has also been shown to be sh safe and effective. Um, but if it's going to be weekly, it would be better capped at 56.